Well, welcome everyone. It's so great to see uh, the uh, wide range of interests that's been shown, the attendees, uh, the participants uh, in today's session. Um, I've, I've got to say that if you go to the chat, uh, Karen is giving you a few hints in terms of all participants, uh, saving bandwidth and uh, uh, remaining on mute. Uh, we've got an all-star lineup for you. And in the next hour and a half, we hope to have some really thought-provoking discussions. Just to give you a sense, uh, we've got about 177 uh, people who have indicated interest in attending, and you'll see them join uh, throughout the presentations, uh, throughout the discussions. Uh, it, this is a wide-ranging audience. We're so pleased to see legal, policing, policy, government, private, public sector uh, from across Canada. Uh, there's a huge representation here from Saskatchewan, which is where we're based, but it's so nice to see our friends from other provinces, from Western Canada and Eastern Canada. So a uh, welcome everyone here today. In celebration of Law Day, the Johnson Shama Graduate School of Public Policy, or in short terms, JSGS, and the Saskatchewan branch of the Canadian Bar Association are pleased to partner on today's lecture. Addressing the opioid crisis, public health, policing, and charter implications. My name is Dan Florzone. I'm an executive in residence with JSGS, and I'll also be today's uh, event moder moderator. At this time, uh, to kick things off, I'd like to acknowledge that while today's event is taking place virtually and online, uh, the physical location of both the Canadian Bar Association Saskatchewan and JSGS are located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories. These are the original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Salto, uh, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. Additionally today, we have speakers joining from Edmonton and Ottawa. The city of Edmonton is located on Treaty 6 territory. In addition, to being the homeland of the Métis. And the city of Ottawa is located on unceded lands of the Yanishabi Algonquin Nation, who are the traditional guardians of the land. So I'm glad to welcome those of you joining us today from across Turtle Island and make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside or are visiting. It's also important to acknowledge that uh, in addition to today being Law Day here, uh, it's also Red Dress Day. Uh, so we're recognizing uh, today um, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls from across uh, the country, uh, and our thoughts and prayers are certainly uh, with them um, as we build awareness into that plight and uh, um, the need for us uh, to uh, resolve many of the outstanding issues that remain. To help our event run smoothly, we ask that all attendees stay muted and turn off their video during the presentation portion of our event. So feel free to turn uh, your videos back on for the Q&A portion. Uh, so if you're addressing, and it, it will give, I'll give some instructions on the Q&A, just so we know who you are uh, when you uh, ask a question. Uh, I will be actually posing the question, but you'll be doing this uh, through the chat. So the form format for today's event is as follows. Uh, following my introductory remarks, which I hope to wrap up soon, our panelists will each provide a 10 minute overview of the issues. Following this, we'll open it up to the audience Q&A for the remaining time. And if you'd like to ask a question, I ask that you use the Zoom's chat function to send your question to me, Dan Florzo and I'll read out your question. So feel free to submit questions at any time during today's event. I'll just simply queue them up and do my best in this limited time to cycle through them. If you have any logistical questions during today's event, 
Don't hesitate to send a message directly to Karen Jaster LaForge. And that message is best sent by Zoom's chat or by email. And her, her email is jsgs.events at uregina.ca. You'll be able to find Karen's contact information in the chat. Uh, please note that as with all our public lectures, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the JSGS website at a later date. This lecture would not uh, exist if not for the partnership between the school, JSGS, and the Saskatchewan branch of the Canadian Bar Association. And for that, we're so very grateful. For those of you who don't know about JSGS, our school, I'm pleased to let you know that uh, we've become a national hub for advanced study and research in public policy administration. We're a unique partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan. And this partnership is based on the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that really defines our province. Since our inception in 2007, we've swiftly become one of Canada's leading policy schools for educating graduate students and public servants interested in and devoted to advancing public value. Now, I'd like to turn to Mark Adolin, uh, who is the Canadian Bar Association Saskatchewan Treasurer to bring greetings and provide some of the background information on behalf of the Bar Association in Saskatchewan. So Mark, welcome. Thank you. Um, it's a privilege to bring greetings on behalf of the Canadian Bar Association Saskatchewan branch, our board of directors, and our 1300 provincial members. Uh, with uh, 37,000 uh, members of the Canadian Bar Association across Canada. On April 17, 1982, the Constitution Proclamation was signed by Queen Elizabeth II and then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. This brought the Constitution home and enacted the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Canadian Bar Association introduced Law Day in 1983 to commemorate the event and educate the public about the legal system. We're pleased to once again partner with the Johnson Shoyama School of Public Policy with this lecture series. As citizens of Canada, we all have a role to play in addressing a serious issue that is affecting millions of people across Canada, the opioid crisis. Whether it's by supporting loved ones who are struggling with addiction, volunteering with organizations that provide addiction support, or advocating for policy changes at the government level, we can all make a difference. We hope today's discussion is informative and that we come together to support those who are struggling with addiction and work towards a brighter, healthier future for all. And thank you on behalf of the Canadian Bar Association, Saskatchewan branch. Hey, Mark, thank you so much. So I don't think it goes without saying that the opioid crisis is um, a very significant, and in the words of a public policy perspective, a wicked problem. Something that we face and its complexity that reflects it's not going to be something we, you know, health care our way out of or police our way out of. Um, no single sector owns this, nor should it uh, think that uh, it could uh, in, in some way resolve it. This is going to take intersectoral partnership, and that's a major theme uh, in today's discussion. That's the promise is, and the promising part of this is clearly the reflection of the diversity of this team who have decided to show up today uh, in this important debate and discussion. So I want to uh, now, uh, now that that's out of the way, introduce today's speakers. And I'll, I'll introduce them in the order that they're speaking, and then I'll turn to them. So uh, Vanessa Grubin, if you want to just give away Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa is a member of the common law section of the University of Ottawa. Faculty, faculty of Law, where she che teaches uh, property law and family law. Professor Grubin also teaches a seminar on access to health care. Now, she has a rich and diverse background in terms of charter and Supreme Court and uh, the, the uh, support, and her interest in health care is uh, absolutely fascinating. Her research focuses on uh, the legal regulation of various aspects, various aspects rather, of assisted human reproduction, including contractual disputes over frozen embryos, uh, privacy and access to information, regulation and funding of assisted reproductive technologies, and the constitutionality of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act. 
Her research also includes health law more generally, as well as the protection of language, language rights in Canada. And uh, obviously her keen interest in harm reduction in uh, opioid, uh, in opioid use and the crisis has brought her here today. So we're so pleased to have Vanessa with us. Chief Dale McPhee. Dale, you want to give a shout out, a wave? Uh, Chief uh, McPhee was uh, sworn in as Edmonton's 23rd Chief of Police for Edmonton. Uh, he uh, has an extensive background in policing, including 26 years as a police officer in my hometown, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, nine of those as Chief of Police. He also served as six for six years um, and I got to work with him there as uh, in his role as Deputy Minister of Corrections and Policing in the Ministry of Justice for the Saskatchewan government. Uh, he served as pre president and past president of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, held the position with, uh, held positions rather with the Saskatchewan Association of Chiefs of Police, the Saskatchewan Federation of Police Officers, and the Canadian Police Association. He has an extensive background. Not only is he a gifted speaker and leader, many of us are big fans and students of Dale McPhee and the work that he has done. He actually sat on one of our health boards and uh, uh, his disruptive uh, approach that allowed us to learn uh, was uh, will never be forgotten. So we're really proud uh, and pleased uh, to have Chief uh, Dale McPhee here uh, with us. Uh, Dr. John Mark of Pondo. Uh, you meet John Mark once and you'll never forget him. His smile and uh, uh, his approach, uh, his leadership. Uh, Jean Marc is uh, uh, works uh, and has been in Saskatoon. I think Jean Marc, it would be about twenty years that uh, I recall your work in those early days. He's a medical health officer, uh, SHA co lead on communicable disease, lead on harm reduction, uh, and he's been invo involved in inspiring much of our knowledge across Canada. Some of his studies on the core areas of Saskatoon. Uh, inequities that had occurred, uh, his work around harm reduction, around HIV, around STDs, around communicable disease is well published, well read, and we consider him and uh, a leader, and uh, not only a leader in Saskatchewan, but across Canada. So Jean-Marc, uh, I owe you a debt of gratitude for being here, and we really appreciate you rounding out uh, this panel. So now that you know who's presenting today, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Vanessa to get our uh, started. So Vanessa, a big a heartfelt welcome uh, from Western Canada uh, to uh, our forum. Thank you very much, Dan. It's uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for the invitation. So I've been asked today to um, provide some initial thoughts on the role of law in either facilitating or acting as a barrier uh, for Canadians who are seeking access to harm reduction services. And so in the 10 minutes, I'm going to try my best, Dan, to stick to that 10 minutes uh, that I've got. I'd like to do a few things. I'm going to provide some very brief statistics that sort of illustrate the severity of the crisis that we're facing today in Canada. Um, I'd like to describe a couple of different types of harm reduction services that reduce the harms that are arising from the overdose epidemic. And uh, I'd like to discuss a few cases where individuals have brought charter claims um, when governments have either restricted access to services or limited services, harm reduction services in some way. Uh, so it's a tall order for 10 minutes, but I'm going to do my best and to the extent that I don't get into as many details as I'd like, happy to answer questions during the question period. So in terms of the uh, the severity of the overdose uh, epidemic, uh, you know, most recent statistics from the public health agency really uh, continue to illustrate what a crisis we find ourselves in uh, in Canada. Um, when we look at the statistics, uh, approximately 20 deaths per day in 2022 as a result of apparent opioid uh, toxicity. Um, that number is, uh, is a high number. It's increasing. If we look at 2019, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, that number was 10 deaths per day. 
uh, was at a peak in 2021 uh, with a with 21 deaths per day. But we're really in a, in a very serious crisis in Canada, and one of the primary drivers of that crisis is a toxic drug supply. The Canadian Public Health Association, or the excuse me, the Canadian Public Health Agency, uh, indicating that in uh, close to 81 percent uh, of those deaths are involving um, fentanyl. So there are a number of different types of harm reduction services that have been introduced to mitigate the harms associated with illicit drug use. And I'm just going to touch on a couple of them today because those are the harm reduction services where we see the law being uh, quite squarely engaged uh, and uh, at the heart of some of these charter claims. So the first uh, set of uh, harm reduction programs are safe, uh, safe consumption programs. And the second um, group of uh, harm reduction services are, are what's known as injectable opioid agonist treatment and safer supply. And those types of harm reduction services, what they seek to do is to provide people who use drugs with a safer alternative to the toxic uh, illicit drug supply. Um, and it essentially expands access to regulated substances that are prescribed with a goal of replacing those, uh, those illicit opioids. Um, safer supply can be offered in a supervised setting uh, or it can be offered in an unsupervised setting where somebody gets a prescription and, and goes to fill the prescription and then uh, takes, uh, takes that uh, pharmaceutical grade alternative outside uh, of a clinic. Um, and that's, begin that's gonna be relevant when we look at some of the cases uh, in a few minutes. It's important to note that these types of programs uh, operate under exemptions from the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, uh, which criminalizes, of course, possession and trafficking uh, of drugs. There are a couple of provisions in the CDSA that confer a discretionary power on the Federal Minister of Health to grant an exemption for medical, scientific, or public interest purposes. And those exemptions are required uh, for these services to be offered so that harm reduction staff and clients aren't prosecuted for drug possession or trafficking offenses, okay? So there have been a number of important charter cases that involve access to harm reduction services. I don't have time today to get into all of them, but I'd like to highlight a few just to give you a sense of what the types of charter arguments are that are being raised by applicants and how the courts are dealing with these kinds of cases. Um, before I dive into the cases, just a couple of words about the charter rights that are at issue. Uh, so in these cases, we see three, primarily three rights being argued, three charter rights being argued. The first, which is Section 7. Section 7 protects an individual's right to life, uh, liberty, and security of the person and the right not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. There's been a whole lot of judicial ink spilled on what the principles of fundamental justice are, and I'm not going to get into that today, but suffice it to say, there's a requirement that laws not be arbitrary, that they not be overbroad, not be grossly disproportionate. Okay. The second right that's often argued in these cases is the right to equality, the right to non-discrimination. And then the third right, the in, third individual right that is raised in some of these cases is the Section 12 right to be free from cruel and unusual treatment. So we see those three rights at play in these cases. It's important to note under the Charter that our rights are not unlimited. There is a section in the Charter, Section 1, uh, and Section 1 says the government can limit rights where it's reasonable and justified in a free and democratic society. And there's a fairly elaborate legal test that the courts apply in determining whether uh, that section one test is met. But suffice it to say, it's really the, the courts are looking here at whether the law is proportionate, the objective of the legislation is pressing and substantial. Okay, so let's take a take a quick tour through some of these cases. Um, perhaps the best known case is the Supreme Court of Canada's decision uh, in the Insight case. So Insight um, is a is a, a safer uh, is a uh, supervised consumption site. Excuse me, in British Columbia which had received a three-year exemption under that provision of the Controlled Drugs, Drugs and Substances Act, Section 56. Uh, and despite a number of positive peer-reviewed research findings, Insight uh, encountered difficulty when it was seeking to renew its Section 56 exemption. There was a ch change in government 
Uh, and instead of renewing Insight's exemption, um, the Minister of Health decided to grant a temporary extension and directed Health Canada to convene an expert advisory committee to determine uh, what to do about, um, uh, about uh, granting a continued exemption. The committee confirmed Insight's public health benefits um, and the fact that it had no negative uh, impact on the community in, 20, uh, in 2008, but sort of in mid-2007, there was the concern that that exemption might not be granted, that the facility would be shut down. And so a couple of clients together with some other applicants uh, brought a court action seeking to secure the ongoing operation of Insight. And among some of the constitutional arguments that were made in that case um, is that the plaintiffs claimed that the minister's uh, failure to exercise uh, the discretion under Section 56 violated their Section uh, 7 charter rights. The Supreme Court of Canada agreed in a unanimous decision. The court found that based on the extensive evidentiary record before it, Insight prevented overdose deaths and risky drug injection practices, did not increase public disorder. And it found that the ministers, in the, in the face of that evidence, the minister's decision not to renew its exemption violated the Section 7 charter rights of clients and staff. So the court ordered the Minister of Health to reverse his decision and grant the exemption. There have also been a couple of recent cases concerning reductions or limitations to harm reduction services. Both of these have arisen in Alberta through some ch legislative changes that have been going on with respect to access to, to different types of harm reduction services. Um, both of these cases are what we call interlocutory injunctions. So it's not a decision on the full charter claim, but it is, uh, it is a decision where the court is looking at um, whether or not there's a serious issue to be tried with respect to the charter. Essentially, the type of relief that's being requested in these case, cases is the clients who are using these services are, are hoping that the uh, status quo will continue, that the changes will not come into effect while the larger charter claim is ongoing. So the first claim uh, was an unsuccessful claim for an interlocutory injunction, and that arose out of uh, some recent changes to the injectable uh, opioid agonist treatment programs in Alberta, the IOT programs. Essentially, the way that those changes uh, came about is that although IOT um, would continue to be offered at one particular facility, there would be important changes to the program, namely the delivery of primary care services and wraparound services, which are uh, critical components to the delivery of these harm reduction services. And the government's decision to restrict those services had a significant impact on their clients, many of whom began to disengage from the services and some of whom brought, uh, brought this claim. Um, the argument in uh, the, the case was that there was a serious issue to be tried and, and that the, the claimants would suffer irreparable harm because if the injunction wasn't granted and these supports were not in place, they would return to using street opioids, which would uh, impinge their rights to, to uh, life and security of the person. As we know, the use of um, unregulated opioids is inherently dangerous um, because of the unpredictable nature. Uh, of the, the toxic drug supply. The court dismissed uh, that application. Um, the trial judge uh, found uh, on the evidence um, that the plaintiffs would only uh, suffer minor harm uh, because some of these services were being offered on a, would continue, just would be reduced uh, in, in terms of the scale. Um, importantly, in that case, the judge trial judge did did note that he might have reached a different conclusion had the province planned to terminate the program entirely as opposed to making these changes. By contrast, another Alberta decision in, where an injunction uh, that was sought was successful, and this claim arose out of restrictions to accessing safer supply, namely prohibiting the use of opioids outside a treatment facility. So Alberta's revised provincial regulation and standards prohibit the prescription of certain narcotics to individuals with opioid dependency for use outside a treatment facility. And in this case, the applicant uh, who was being treated um, at the ODP clinic in Calgary was, uh, was uh, 
fill, filling her prescription at a local pharmacy and then taking uh, taking her hydromorphone at home. So this program would have uh, discontinued that uh, treatment plan for the applicant. The evidence established that uh, this treatment plan enabled the applicant to avoid toxic street source opioids, including illicit fentanyl. It enabled her to establish a more stable and healthy lifestyle. It improved her medical and psychological supports. And so she argued that the failure to allow her to continue with that treatment plan uh, would violate her section 7, 12, and 15 rights. So in granting the injunction, the court did hold that there were, um, that that claim raised serious issues, uh, that the changes to the form of treatment could have a significant impact on her section seven rights and also on her section 15, uh, section 15 rights. Court finally found that the applicant had established based on the uh, evidence before them that she would suffer irreparable harm if she was unable to continue with her current treatment, um, finding that there was a genuine risk that she would revert um, back to the use of street sourced uh, opioids. And so in granting the injunction, um, Ms. Black and her clinical team was exempted from this re revised uh, legal framework. So those are a couple of cases before I know I'm out of time, Dan, but I do just want to mention very quickly um, that when we're thinking about the law, I'd be remiss not to say something about uh, decriminalization of simple possession. I'm sure this is something that's going to be discussed. There's been quite a um, quite a, a bit of movement towards decriminalization recently, uh, as we know, uh, beginning uh, at the beginning of January this year, the province uh, of British Columbia is operating under an exemption with respect uh, to the criminal penalties that apply to uh, adults for possession uh, of uh, certain. Uh, illicit drugs uh, for personal use. There are other uh, municipalities, City of Toronto is one, where uh, some of the similar exemption applications are pending. And so uh, we're really, when we think about sort of the, the legal landscape right now, there's quite a bit um, that's going on with respect to, to harm reductions between charter claims uh, and this movement towards, uh, towards drug decriminalization in certain jurisdictions. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And, and I wanted to just kind of warm you up to uh, one of the questions that I wanted to pose right after uh, the three speakers have uh, concluded. And I know I'm kind of jumping the queue by uh, uh, suggesting it. But what I wanted to do is just if, if, if there is an answer, it may take just a bit of reflection. And that is uh, when we talk about the charter section 7, 12, and 15, are they subject to notwithstanding clause? And uh, I ask that because of uh, the political interests and the provincial uh, interests in being able to kind of counteract where a decision comes in and there's a political or philosophical difference between uh, the charter right and a societal or political view. So I'll just leave that as a bit of a warm up. Not sure if that's the proper question, not being a, a legal scholar, but uh, I just couldn't help myself. Chief uh, McPhee, how are you, Dale? Welcome. Thanks, Dana. I'm good. And uh, it's a good thing you have a legal team working with you to ask that question. Um, <laughs> just, just to get started here, first and foremost, I want to thank yourself and Amy and Karen uh, for the invitation here to speak. And just kind of up front, <clears throat> although, you know, I've known John Mark for quite uh, some time, just met Vanessa, you know, there's going to be different angles that come into this. And I think everybody what we need to realize is even though we have different perspectives, we're trying to get to the same thing, which is a healthier and safer community. And I think as your intro says, it's going to take a combination of things if we're truly going to get there. From my perspective, I'm just going to try to talk about some of the lessons we've learned, uh, some of the potential research that we've done, both from Edmonton Police Service back when we were in the government of Saskatchewan and uh, in Alberta today overall. And I, I think I would start with the fact in the last two years, <clears throat> I sat on three different task forces for the government of Alberta. I sat on the mental health and addictions task force, which part of that had a, a testimony piece that we had to give to elected officials of which I would have testified from obviously different perspectives with some of the leading doctors in, in uh, mental health and addictions from across the world, including uh, those that stood up the Portugal model. 
I s sat on the human trafficking task force, and then I co-chaired the housing and homeless task force. And you know what the really interesting part is, is they're the same for a large part of this. And it basically comes down to mental health and addictions being at the center of some of the conflict, which also tells us how complex it is and that we actually need to look at things differently. In the Alberta Association of Chiefs of Police, which I'm part of, uh, we uh, did a study that was led by Dr. Julian Sumners and Dr. Giannis Boschner. Julian, one of the leading uh, folks from this, uh, from Simon Fraser. Uh, then it was reviewed by uh, Dr. Onawa uh, LaBelle, Dr. Link, later Indigenous psychologist, Ray Wyant, former Chief Judge of Manitoba. We had Howard Sapers and as well as uh, Dr. Amy Potras uh, on child and youth from Ontario. We, from that report, came up with a statement that we do not support uh, decriminalization of drugs. And I, and I just want to emphasize, at this point in time, the reason for that decision is, is there's no system in place to actually treat the individuals that actually need the help. Uh, and that's going to be a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about in relation to some of the lessons we learned. There's basically a science project that's taking place that uh, the rest of the world's uh, looking at right now. It's the difference between the recovery model and the BC model of decriminalization of safe supply. This is quite the topic at our CACP board meetings. Uh, since this has happened, some of the BC overdoses are going straight up and there's no sign of letting up. And certainly certain things that we're doing in Alberta are working, but not to say that we have it perfectly right either, because there's a lot of work yet to be done in such a complex issue. The recovery system basically looks at it from a different perspective. Uh, it does include harm reduction, but it also includes intervention and prevention. It includes treatment enforcement on a path to recovery, recognizing that not everybody might get to a path of recovery, but it recognizes that the individuals uh, that are caught up in this or obviously have complex and different issues. When we talk about safe consumption sites, an interesting thing happened in Alberta. Edmonton has three safe consumption sites, was four, and now we're going to be four again, possibly. There's a study being done right now. Calgary has one, and we have uh, double the overdoses in the province than anybody else. So it just adds more questions. We all know that harm reduction is part of this, but where do we actually get to when we start to look at this? One of the questions, and I just spoke on some of this at the U of T uh, at Massey College actually on Monday, and one of the things that we try to look at here, and I just want to emphasize this, I have a slide, but I didn't think we were doing slides, so I'll just kind of explain it. There is five people, I, we just gave these people names, uh, these names aren't relevant, race isn't relevant, anything's not relevant to this conversation, it's just five individuals. And I'm going to give those in alphabetical order. Uh, so there's Bob. Bob is that individual uh, that's located outside the mall of which our office tower is right now. Bob is using meth. Uh, obviously, Bob is a little bit unpredictable. He still has his faculties in relation to him. He's in possession with meth, smoking meth, while mom and her children are walking into the mall. They're scared. And for right reasons, sometimes people on meth do things that they normally wouldn't do if they wouldn't or if they weren't using it. So what do we do with Bob? Well, right now we have basically a notice for federal prosecutions. It's been in existence since 2020 that says unless we have exiguating circumstances, we will not prosecute for simple possession. So what do we do with Bob? Really, all we can do is send Bob on his way. Perhaps we can take his drugs and we can actually put it through the CDSA because it's still illegal and we still could seize it. But is that solving the problem? Then in that same spot, next day, there's Charlie. Charlie is that individual that he's basically out front of the mall. Mom and kids are coming in again. He's laying right in front of it. And he's, you know, with no disrespect to anybody, bending in ways that he never should bend. We know Charlie and the doc's shaking his head here that this has fentanyl. And what do we do with Charlie? Where do we take Charlie? You know, does it matter if it's legal or illegal? What are we going to do with Charlie? Do we leave him there and let mom and, and her children uh, get scared going through there? 
That's what we're dealing with today. Now, what we're trying to build out in the recovery system is we need a ride for Charlie, whether he's going to another health facility, not necessarily a hospital jam up emergency room, but a step down community facility. We need to take Charlie somewhere. And Charlie needs, if he's going to use, obviously, in a safe environment, but the other part is, you know, we also have to take into consideration that the people that are actually using those facilities for, you know, for their family. Then we got Devin. Devin is walking around. He's punching the air. He's not in his right mind right now. He's somewhat uh, agitated, very agitated. There's belief through some of the people that know him that he is going to do or he's going to harm somebody. Devin's banned from the shelters. Devin's banned from many areas in transit and everywhere else. What do we do with Devin? Well, the only thing that we have right now, if it is drugs, is we can actually lodge him under the alcohol piece in the, uh, that exists in, in our provincial legislation. We can lodge for 24 hours. So what we're doing now in the recovery system is our old detention management unit is ran by a health facility that's a community clinic called Radius. Radius will look at getting uh, Devon on Suboxone, which they don't overdose for 24 hours, Sublocade, which could be 30 days paid for by the government, but giving Devon the ability to deal with himself. Then we got Evan. Evan is the same individual that's using meth or some other drug and he's in transit. He shot somebody, he stabbed somebody, he's hurt somebody or punched somebody. Devin needs to go to the justice system and needs to be dealt with accordingly for rehabilitation and how the justice system was designed to do. Then there's Frank. Frank is that gang member, Red Alert or other gangs that through COVID and everyone else has infiltrated our vulnerable communities and they're creating a considerable amount of disruption moving their narcotics and their drugs. Frank again will be dealt with with the justice system. Here's the problem and why I give you these examples. A lot of people think that's the same person. A lot of people think that will be solved by giving them a house. A lot of people think that will be solved by harm reduction. A lot of people think that will be solved by putting people in jail. The reality is, is none of it will be solved by that because each one of those individuals are different. Until we have a system that actually can deal with that and has some accountability. And what I mean by accountability, accountability doesn't necessarily mean the justice system. There's accountability in the health system, the right of choice, the ability to have a dissuasion commission such as Portugal, where it's a health model that gets people access to treatment on their own choice. So where I'm going with that, we think, and we're doubling down, that the relationship and the partnership here from a policing perspective is law enforcement, public health. So we've taken a lot of steps in redesigning our police service to deal with that. We have help teams, that's police and crisis workers. The province just funded us for another 14 of them. They have basically had, um, uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of the statistics, they have dealt with, in 2021, 889 referrals. In 2022, 2,641 referrals. And already this year, 664. They have a 36 to 37% uh, success rate of getting people out of the justice system connected with the right ability to do that. Then we have PACT. Police and crisis workers. Keep in mind, when people use meth, it's generally not safe. People want to send a social worker. People want to send a police officer. Why don't we do both and send a police and a mental health worker together? If it's not safe, the police leave. If it's safe, they leave. The reality is it's the relentless follow-up that actually works, where we stop people from coming in the system the 5th, the 15th, the 20th, the 50th time. And that is by exercising what we have in our own authorities, no, no change in law required, but to actually use the partnership approach. They had 5,031 calls in 2021 and 6,692 in 2022 with a significant success rate. Then the other thing our government has added, we have a virtual opioid dependency program in every one of our DMUs. What that means is that we basically have a 24-7 access to a doctor online or and we have uh, paramedics in all of our detention management units 
that can actually work with that doctor. We've offered since inception, which is just over a year, 1,255 offers uh, speaking with a doctor. Only 332 declined. It's got a 76% success rate with a 54% of non-recidivism coming in relation to it that is actually starting to have some impact on our overdoses. Again, it's their choice. It's not forced, but the reality is when people have access to that in that point of need to have the access to services, it makes a difference. That uh, for us is something that uh, we're seeing some significant results in relation to it. Now, we know that Suboxone prevents overdoses for 24 hours. We know Sublocate is 30 days. Our, act, our hope is to move from the 24-hour to, obviously, the 30-day, the which our government is going to pay for in the recovery system. The government is giving us more navigators, more packed workers. We're going to move now to having mental health workers in our dispatch center because, let's face it, police take the initial call on a lot of these things. And now with those teams in approach, we can actually get this into the right system at the earliest opportunity. We have our detention management unit, as I mentioned, ran by Radius Health. And now we're going to build a joint law enforcement public health uh, facility that's led by health that keeps people out of emergency rooms, keeps people out of the justice system, which will then filter into the recovery communities, which the province is building seven across the country. If we learn one thing, in uh, the housing and homeless uh, piece that a city, take Edmonton, I'll just give you the Edmonton example, has zero chance of solving homelessness unless they look at parallel system in three regionalized nations, unless they look at some of our surrounding communities. For us, it's with Askman, Grand Prairie, a little bit of Wood Buffalo and a couple others. They follow the same patterns as the hospitals and the justice system. So what we're really saying is there's huge opportunities. We got to stop getting caught up in language, which we're talking harm reduction and we're talking recovery. And the reality is we need a system. That's why we've taken the position. That's why we do believe from a policing context, we're on the right path. Is it perfect? No. Are there things that actually need to be looked at? But I don't know of too many groups or countries that have had a better success than Portugal. And they really haven't decriminalized some of the things in drug. Two and a half milligrams of legalized or what's a safe supply two and a half grams in relation to uh, fentanyl kills a lot of people so i think when we talk safe supply we got to be very careful the other thing is is what we've talked about lots here is we keep talking about a commodity versus the people you know at one point it was basically you know marijuana legalized marijuana because that's going to take away the black market and the drug trade it hasn't it hasn't even slowed it down that <clears throat> now that said has it driven any damage no cheesy sales have gone up is kind of the thing i always say in relation to that but the reality is the same people that use marijuana some of them always use fentanyl as well do we need a fentanyl strategy is the next one we're going to build a meth strategy on violence what we're saying is let's build a people strategy that gives people the options, has some accountability built into it. Accountability doesn't have to come from the justice system. For the first time ever, our chiefs met with the premiers of every province. It was a really good discussion. It was just a couple of weeks ago. I was one of the four chiefs on that. This was one of the major topics, along with bail reform and other things. And it all boils down to some form of accountability with an olive branch to give people help at the earliest opportunity to do things differently. Because we all know that we're not trying to put vulnerable into the justice system. It makes no sense. That has changed. That's old news, certainly in most police agencies across this country and most health uh, across this country as well. So what we're really trying to do is focus on a system. We're a little bit passionate on this, as we all are. We see our biggest partners and our best partners right now is how do you put law enforcement and public health together? Dan, you and I have talked about this lots. Law enforcement have the ability to reverse engineer. Public health has the ability to engineer. And if those two bookends could ever get this right and share the right information, who knows? We could probably shrink social services by 20 to 30 percent with a little effort. We need all those services. But the reality is we can't continue to do things the same way without changing the way we operate. 
changing laws in all due respect to everybody or giving safe supply and making it like if you think about CERB in relation to our drug trade, when you give money to individuals that aren't maybe at their best and make not good decisions, it has consequences. So I think the whole message is, is we have to be careful. We have to have options. It's not one option, and we're really adamant on that. And certainly we're seeing success when it comes to the right partners at the table. So I'll leave it at that, and I know it'll generate some discussion, but thank you very much. I, th I think you might have, Dale. Uh, <laughs> a bit of discussion. We now have a panel. Wow. Okay. Well, we're going to turn to uh, John Mark and uh, from a public health, uh, medical health officer perspective, uh, kind of get your take uh, and perspective on this. So thank you very much, Dale and John Mark. Uh, you're up. Yeah. So thanks, Dan. And, and really, thank you for both, um, you know, the two panelists who went before me. I, I thought that was really good and really helpful. And it, it really teased me off nicely. Um, and I do want to thank um, the Johnson Shiarma School, Dan and um, the team, Karen, who invited me. I feel very honored and privileged. And thank you everyone who's had time to uh, attend. I, I'm not gonna go through the slides in detail, but they'll be there if you want them. This is more for me as a crutch so that I can stay focused. So. Next slide, please, Karen. And uh, this is just to recognize Law Day. Actually, this is something that I, I, I wish we had it more publicized because I, I worked in Saskatchewan for 20 years and um, had not yet crossed my radar, but this is a really useful and an important opportunity for us to come and talk because I think as uh, you've heard from Dale, and as you'll hear a little bit on my continued discussion, there's a lot of intersection in our work, but not only that, even in the people we serve. Next slide, please. So my main uh, take uh, or, or disclaimer, if I can put it in that way, is I truly understand this is a complex and a controversial topic. And uh, there's lots of different perspectives and arguments. And certainly I, I feel my preceding speakers did an excellent job. And I know when we talk about drug and drug policy and the public and harm reduction and all those um, innovative approaches, it's very controversial. And it's interesting sort of hearing as much as Saskatchewan is actually to the right or to the east of BC and Alberta, I feel many times we're like right in the middle. This is kind of really good. And it's important to hear this. Um, we did hear a little bit about the stats, but I think we cannot underestimate, you know, the impact of contaminated product that has fentanyl. Fentanyl is one of the most powerful opiates. And, um, you know, the Canadian, the, according to Health Canada, more than 15,000 people have died from opiate-related deaths between January of 2016 and December of 2019. And um, yeah, the numbers per day go up and down, but many, many of these deaths were caused by contamination of street drugs with fentanyl. And um, I think Dale touched a little bit about this when he talked about the five profiles. You know, not all those same guys are the same, but fentanyl actually, uh, when it's thrown into the mix, it, it, it's a big trafficking issue here. And there's lots of money there. So let me throw in a little bit of my controversy there. But um, my position, and I'm coming at this from a health perspective, is the opiate crisis is a health problem. And... Um, I think what you've heard, and particularly some of the cases that the court has been asked to adjudicate, is really trying to bring in some of this evidence-based responses and really look at it from the framework of this shouldn't be a, a criminal response where it is not appropriate, as uh, Dale has painted such a good picture, that there are different profiles. And certainly, if this is a, a, a health and a health issue, we really want to come at it from that point of view. It's important when we really look at the individuals, the, the people-centered view of this, is people who use drugs. Many of them face stigma, discrimination. They have access to accessing treatment and even harm reduction services, which are really designed to sort of meet the needs of this special population. But just being a drug user is quite a stigmatized 
uh, affair and stigmatized uh, uh, activity. As much as David thought I was shaking my head, I was actually just <laughs> nodding because this is almost typical. If you have a drug user standing in front of a mall, just the fact that this is a drug user, that brings all kinds of people, you know, all they, everybody gets kind of wound up about that. But um, I do think uh, the point about decriminalizing and criminalizing opiate for personal use and possession, uh, it, 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 it is an innovation and it is probably an evidence way to move forward because if you really now dig into the health issues, and I'm not going to, this presentation is not about the health itself, but the root causes of addiction, such as trauma, poverty, mental illness, social isolation, those are really the things that are the causes of the causes. And I, I, I really like Dale's image that it painted for me, you know, we have some reverse engineering um, public policy, but we also have engineering and truly I, I, I'm feeling that language resonates with me, but let's hear what the questions bring forward. But um, I really feel that um, overemphasizing on any particular aspect, particularly the criminal justice tool aimed at the individual user level, it, it does violate freedoms of people, uh, who use drugs and um, some of the charter issues. And it's really interesting just comparing the charter positions that Vanessa outlined. So we'll go to the next slide. I think um, I got two out of three. And the, the third one, the right to healthcare, is not really a charter statement, but it is implied in section 36. And I'll kind of go through it. So, so Vanessa, I've captured section 12, and I need to go and read that again. <laughs> Like Dan, I'll claim I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I thought that that was a really interesting take. But the right to life and liberty, the right to equality, and the right to healthcare. And uh, I think Vanessa has kind of gone through quite a bit of this, so it'll give me a good takeoff. Next slide. So just the right to life, this section seven, life, liberty, security of person. You know, by criminalizing opiate use and possession, you know, the government does force people who, to obtain their drugs from illegal and unsafe sources because most of these illicit drugs are still classified as illegal. And um, in many places, um, not only are street involved people who use or access some of these drugs, even relatively functioning addicts, you know, they feel unsafe and they don't want to be out and visible. So just tapping the illegal illicit market seems to be the most undercover way and that puts them into a lot of risk. And if you do run into problems calling 911 for a weekend overdose, there's a couple of real heartbreaking stories where people who don't use drugs often, you know, they're weekend users, they've sent the kids off to grandma and grandpa and they're planning to party and, you know, they just dialed an unsuspecting, you know, provider who gave them a contaminated product. And we've seen some really heart, um, heartbreaking consequences. And this is really out of fear of arrest and prosecution. And um, in terms of uh, arbitrary arrest and detention, that, that language might sound a little bit harsh in terms of me speaking. But uh, I know it isn't as arbitrary as that when we're dealing with these individuals. I think Dale has actually painted a really interesting picture. We have lots of tables where we meet with law enforcement. Um, the intersection of our work is actually quite, um, quite important. And we do come together in terms of trying to make our work flow better. Um, but the main argument is our current environment. It just seems like... Um, the main tool that's used. And I think I, I'm really thinking of Dale's um, argument where I think truly there isn't enough uh, treatment and support. So we're using one tool and the tool is usually about enforcement and that ends up uh, depriving individuals who are addicted. And maybe I'll go into a little bit of why addiction is such a problem. Next slide, please. So, the thing about uh, the right of equality is the, the, the sticky problem that the people who use drugs and use substances because of addictions, the people who run afoul of the law and are usually um, clients of the 
criminal justice system, whether it's policing, whether it's uh, incarceration or corrections. And many of the people who are either in front of our legal system or clients of our legal fraternity, many times are the same people. You know, this is this is actually <laughs> the, the interesting intersection of all this. And people who use these opioids often belong to marginalized groups, not always, but many times do. And uh, indigenous people, for example, are overrepresented amongst opiate users just due to, you know, historical trauma, uh, both from colonization and residential schools. Um, today is Red Dress Day, so I'm glad this was in, uh, in this part of the presentation, is, you know, women who use uh, opioids also face gender-based violence, stigma, lack of access to gender sensitive services. You know, these could be the traumatic events that really push people who don't have good coping skills to use drugs and to use drugs to just try and help themselves feel better. But I agree that, you know, mental health issues and other disabilities are really what is driving. And this is people's ways of coping, not necessarily the healthiest coping strategies. And um, criminalizing possession, you know, government does further uh, exacerbate the existing inequalities and the unequalness because these are people coming to the table with many, many prejudices and a lot of systematic or systemic issues that they face. And, um, you know, it is a charter issue if you're kind of front loaded because of your characteristics of race, sex, disability, or addiction uh, in the face of law. Next slide, please. This is kind of interesting in doing my preparation for this. And again, I think carries through is a little bit of a theme from the panel. Penrose is an individual, I think in 1936. I'm not sure exactly if, I think he was a physician in the UK, but this preceded even the opiate crisis. He didn't anticipate the opiate crisis or the war on drugs. But what Penrose was arguing was with the reduction of mental health treatment infrastructure, we were seeing, this is the black arrow, an increase in the penal system population. I'll let you go and um, kind of read this uh, seminal paper, it's out there. But it really, behind this, I think um, as academics have further analyzed this, you know, what is implied is, you know, the lack of access to mental health services or untreated mental health illness we've just shifted and we've shifted the burden of that old institutional care into the corrections and uh, the penal system, which is just unfortunate. I think the accelerated Penrose um, effect is now really just saying certain uh, social movements like the war on drugs, certain things that have taken effect have really just accelerated this uh, phenomenon. Next slide, please. And uh, the right to healthcare, uh, as I sort of said in my early disclaimer, this may not be explicitly stated in the charter, but it is implied by the commitment of federal and provincial governments to provide essential public services at reasonable quality to all Canadians. And healthcare is considered one of these essential services, which should include mental health and addiction treatment. And, um, you know, the from a health perspective, we really believe that people who use opioids should have a right to access safe, effective, and affordable healthcare that meets their needs and respects their dignity in terms of issues ranging from privacy, confidentiality, but the whole range that everybody else would expect when they connect with healthcare for help. And some of this might include medication-assisted treatment and uh, you know things like methadone or buprenorphine where nobody argues with those treatment uh, modalities, but there are some uh, ad additional harm reduction approaches such as supervised consumption, uh, naloxone, needle exchange, uh, other harm reductions that we've heard, for example, being able to access more purified uh, medical grade uh, opioids as a harm reduction service this is really considered to be a right to healthcare as well. Um, some of these in interventions have been proven. Actually, these are evidence-based interventions that have been proven to reduce the rate of overdose deaths, 
to prevent infections and improve health outcomes and save costs overall. Um, in this presentation, I'm not gonna talk about the impact of, uh, of uh, street drugs beyond just fentanyl, but contaminated drugs and lack of access to clean supplies and needles can also promote uh, infection with the very serious lifelong pathogens like uh, HIV, uh, hepatitis C, which is now tre uh, treatable as well, but it just promotes the transmission if this continues to be an underground activity. So by criminalizing opioid use and possession, you know, this is also an impediment uh, for delivery of some of these services. And I think Vanessa did uh, point out that to be able to provide some of these harm reduction services, particularly at the advanced, uh, you know, the more innovative harm reduction services like providing um, clean supplies and clean drugs, we actually need to apply for a federal exemption to be able to protect our staff, to handle some of those products. Um, we've introduced in Saskatchewan recently um, a way of testing your street drug uh, when you attend some of our services so you actually know what you're getting. And again, that can only be provided in the context of a federal exemption. Next slide, please. And um, the argument is harm reduction. If you look at sort of the different models that are prevalent in Canada, is, an, is a pragmatic approach. And uh, I, I would argue that even what we've heard from our policing co colleagues is pragmatic. And I think it is helping us really build a system that it's, it's not necessarily, you know, I think sometimes uh, decriminalizing sounds uh, black and white, and, and I certainly feel it might be more of a process. And, um, you know, possession for personal use and investing more in healthcare and social support, those can help, And but I don't claim this is the only answer. I really feel this is an integrated, uh, intersectoral, and an intersectoral approach to deal with this. But certainly this being Law Day, we need to you know, highlight that criminal justice systems have been sort of the go-to and um, is, is problematic, and is problematic in many ways for all of us who are at the table today. Next slide, please. And uh, the next slides are not really essential to part of the argument. That's most of my argument. But just to explain, you know, people use substances for a variety of reasons. This is sort of the background. And this is just a background on addictions, which is, I promise, to be very quick. Next slide. So, you know, and, and the addictions continue. You know, there's some people who use drugs and function, and they're sort of that second beneficial use they need it, whether it's ceremonial or you know, it's prescribed for different reasons, then there's low risk and high risk use. And truly the box that we're worried about is this um, end on the right, the substance use disorder, where you, know, you continue to use even though it is damaging you either socially, mentally, physically, or work-wise. This is, this is the box that becomes extremely problematic. And this is where healthcare is very much, as well as our other systems are very much involved in the people who are in that um, last category. Next slide, please. And just, uh, this is something that uh, I'd said earlier. You know, addiction is not um, a one, status kind of definition. It's a chronic relapsing disorder, and it's really characterized by this compulsion and compulsion to continue using despite the harmful effects. And if you use drugs long enough, it actually changes physiologically the brain. And it is considered both a complex brain disorder and a mental health uh, the, uh, illness. So addiction is the most severe form of this whole spectrum of substance use disorders. And uh, it's a medical illness uh, caused by repeated misuse of a substance or substances. Next slide, please. And uh, just where does this addiction come from? This is just one theory. Next slide. It's, it's, it's trauma. And trauma is, is really a series of events um, that many people experience. And how we cope and cope with trauma is, is different. This is a definition 
from uh, some American experts. I've included the rest, uh, the, the reference there, but trauma is really the genesis of this. And trauma, next slide. Trauma can uh, how people cope with trauma. It's self-harm, disordered eating, substance use. Um, one of the ways of avoiding trauma is avoiding some of those triggers or boundaries. Uh, next slide. I'm looking for one particular slide <laughs> that truly one of the most common um, root causes is early childhood adverse experiences. So this is something that we've recognized in public health. Actually, this brings in another sectoral flair, which is the education sector. So I, I, I certainly see some of the ideas we've heard earlier on, you know, just this probably being a whole government approach, early childhood um, adverse experiences can have lifelong impact. I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but if you're interested, certainly these slides will be made available. But the next slide I think is also interesting to just see the impact of her early childhood trauma is, is widespread and it, it does affect you and it affects all aspects of cognition, physical health, emotional development, relationships, mental health and mental health and addictions that you've heard a lot about behaviors, you know, poor self-regulation, aggression, poor impulse control, sexual risk-taking, drug and alcohol abuse, and brain development, you know. So something that starts in childhood can have long-lasting impacts. And trauma has many, many forms, not just early childhood trauma, intergenerational trauma, historical trauma of groups and populations can manifest in this way. Next slide, please. And people who've experienced trauma, this might be <laughs> something that we all, we all know, but they have many, many risk factors, including drug and alcohol use. This becomes a real problem. And socially, you know, committing suicide is, 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 is a big loss. Um, a lot of the outcomes of these ex traumatic experiences begin to manifest in sort of the teen, to early adult and maybe even in the adult stage of life. And this is supposedly the most productive times of your life. So we're losing a lot in terms of, as a society, we're losing a lot of um, community and community resources to um, the effects of trauma. Next slide, please. We, we, we've got to uh, wrap up soon. We've got to get to the questions, sure. but uh, John Mark, I'll just give you a moment then to just so wrap up. We're done. Actually, Dan, next slide. Uh, that's actually the the the, the quick and um, the, the 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 rapid review of some of the health perspective of uh, the opiate crisis. So thank you. That's excellent. Thank you, John Mark. Uh, Carl uh, Mack asks, is it possible to get a copy of the slides? Yes. Uh, so if we could uh, make sure that those are available uh, to all participants, that would be great. We've got to, uh, I, I kind of put Vanessa on the spot, and I know that this is probably a bigger question than maybe could be answered simply, uh, but I wanted to start there. And then I've got a whole grouping now of uh, chat-related questions for the panel. Vanessa. Sure. So your question was about Section 33 uh, and yeah. your instinct, does it apply or not? Because it doesn't apply to all uh, to all charter rights, but it does apply to Sections 7 to 15. So it would apply oh. to Section 7, 12 and 15. Yeah. Uh, it also applies to Section 2, but it does uh, it does uh, apply to those rights. And so some of those, I think you're, uh, you know, you've raised some of the ideological concerns, perhaps that yeah. the government might yeah. preemptively. Yeah, so section 33 would be in play. <laughs> Thank you so much for the clarification there. Uh, so we're starting to pick up some themes here. Um, the, it isn't about one solution or, uh, you know, kind of the magic solve, the uh, snake oil of uh, all things societal. These are complex issues born out of complex trauma, as uh, Jean-Marc has mentioned. So uh, one of the things, and I'll go to uh, Greg uh, Real, and uh, Greg, I want to just use your simpler comment. Dead people can't detox. So if supply is cleaner and safer with decriminalization, then why oppose this proven strategy? Now, um, I, th I think I could go across to the converted, Jean-Marc, I think you're there. 
they, they'll, you know, it's kind of this tension. How do we keep people alive and safe until they can get to uh, treatment and uh, recovery? Well, I mean, I, I don't, the statement itself, I don't think is really what's there because I, I just told you that we don't charge for simple possession now. Yeah. The reality is, is that's not the issue. The people in jail in Saskatchewan for simple possession, you can count them on both hands, or in, sorry, in Alberta, you can count on both hands last year. So that's changed. The reality is there's still no treatment. And I mean, if if the answer is only long-term, not short-term, because I, I, I believe in harm reduction and I understand harm reduction and actually have looked at the Portugal model. But if the only opportunity to actually change it is keep giving people more drugs and that's going to keep them safe, I don't think we're living in, you know, the realities of having a complete system. Now, the other piece to that is, is any evidence that I've seen studied, and we had this research, most of the studies on decriminalization right now are on marijuana. And that's not what we're talking about here right now. Yeah. This is something totally different. And that's why when we mention let's not focus on the commodity let's focus on giving the people the opportunity with the right choice some accountability perhaps if it's not that but at the end of the day we need the ability to get them to some treatment and some services because yeah i don't think an addict chooses to be an addict i mean if you look back at some of the opioid crisis and as when i co-chaired stats can most of them were people that got hooked on it from the construction industry because they took drugs and at the end of the day they were hooked they didn't sign up for this um, Je Jennifer asks a really interesting question here, and Jennifer Chenard is with uh, JSGS, also spent 10 years at Medical Detox with the SHA, working there, uh, three years at Emergency Child Protection, as it, working as an Emergency Child Protection Officer. Um, she has a number of questions, but the one I wanted to hone in on um, uh, happens to be the Indigenous community, and uh, wondering what sort of consultation is happening with Indigenous groups about the crisis. So uh, what do they say they need? And, and I'm gonna turn this to Jean-Marc, uh, but certainly available and open to any of the panelists. Jean-Marc? Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. So I've had a couple of meetings with the SHA and Indigenous Services Canada with the chiefs and council in a variety of communities. And um, it's really interesting, you know, Number one, there's no one monolithic view of all indigenous um, community leadership. Uh, in my home territory, Treaty 6, which I should have paid my recognition first, you know, we've got a very, um, very supportive leadership who are very much engaged in wellness and wellness work. And I, I think, you know, they argue to me, they, they seem to be more, you know, they want to see uh, treatment and uh, they, they support harm reduction, but they're more along the lines of we need to give people who have, you know, adverse experiences of trauma in their past and their coping and miscoping behavior, we need more services, <laughs> so, so to speak. In Southern Saskatchewan, it's a slightly different um, and this is my interpretation, so I'm not picking on anyone, so and that's why I'm being careful not to name the communities, is, is the, my, my sense is um, they see harm reduction, but are not great fans of harm reduction. They're not great fans of uh, substitution therapy either. And, and that makes it really, really challenging to engage because the reality, this is a chronic medical situation. So we still have some work to do. But um, just to answer your question, honestly, Dan, you know, what I've heard from the, the communities is there's still some misunderstanding. Um, the, the, there's a feeling that some of the medicinal interventions, whether it's opiate substitution or diverted medical products, might be what is behind the, the, the deaths that they're seeing. So the opiate crisis has reached there, but um, we still need to do a better job as healthcare actually clearly making the link between contaminated product and, and, and the elevated the excess mortality that we're seeing, because that doesn't seem to be very apparent, particularly in smaller rural settings. They, they may not see it yet, but it is there. 
Now, one of, one of the challenges that we have, and Ramona raises this, we've talked a lot about supply side issues in the illicit market. However, we know that the opioid crisis involves a combination of prescribed, diverted, and illegal opioid use. Now, that has a certain implication, legal implications, healthcare implications, uh, you know, even the use of e-prescribing to prevent opioid misuse and abuse. There are some tools that are out there that might assist us. Um, the opioid crisis was uh, certainly uh, at least initiated through over-prescribing uh, to a large extent. So where, are we, where do we stand on that? Um, are there measures or methods, uh, Jean-Marc? So um, I, I have to confess here, I'm going to be stepping into the territory of our regulators, but I do know our regulators um, watch the authorized prescribers quite closely. And uh, there is a, a mechanism in which uh, concerns can be raised. The regulators, for those who don't know, are the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan, <laughs> not the SMA, which is where I'm at now. Uh, so the college is, is, is quite, um, well, I know the, 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 the triplicate prescription program, and they do respond when concerns are raised, and they do bring in physicians for you know, prescription review if they think there's a misuse piece. But I think what you're pointing out, Dan, is really, really important, that um, some people who are susceptible can actually be driven down the road of addiction by not well-managed medicinal prescription of opiates. And uh, if there isn't a good strategy and a good weaning, and you know the doctor just gets fed up and cuts you off, <laughs> it's really easy to just go around the street corner and buy something that might even be more powerful. And then- Yeah, the, your, the, your the pharmacist yeah. ends up being the guy wearing a jean jacket. Right. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Femi asks a question. Uh, first of all, thanking the speakers with regard, and this will be Vanessa. I, I, I hope that this isn't too specific, but with regards to safe consumption sites, how do you see Bill 33 impacting the overdose death crisis, especially in Manitoba, where there's no established safe consumption site? Should safe consumption site not be seen as an addition to the overall continuum of care and allow drug users to be engaged safely with their communities? Uh, without safe consumption site, we're likely not to achieve control of overdose-related deaths. So uh, Femi poses the question. Uh, your thoughts and observations, Vanessa? So I won't speak to the bill directly. I think it raises sort of a larger question about the range of options um, that are available, the range of harm reduction services that are available to those who need them. Uh, and I think what the legal cases illustrate is the importance of evidence to su that, that supports the efficacy of those harm reduction services, whether they are supervised consumption sites, whether it's safer supply, whether it's IOT programs. Um, I think what's really critical when we're thinking about the legal frameworks and access to these services is that where there is evidence, as we've seen in, an, in a couple of these cases now that demonstrates that these types of services reduce harm, um, and are effective, that the failure to provide those services can violate, they implicate an individual's charter rights. Um, so that's what we saw, for example, in as it was an uh, injunction, it wasn't the full case on the merits, but we did see the court saying, look, there's a serious issue here. We have evidence that this type of service is effective. And um, by limiting the way in which it can be provided, that is that will engage an individual's charter rights. So where we see different, there's been different types of bills across the country that maybe limit access or change um, uh, options and availability for individuals. I think with, from a legal perspective, what's really important to be thinking about is the evidence. And I think Jean-Marc has touched on this uh, really nicely um, that supports uh, the efficacy uh, of a number of these types of services. So, so Vanessa, I find it interesting that many of the case studies that we looked at were harm reduction programs that were established and then taken away. So I'm wondering about a jurisdiction like Manitoba and its charter implications of never having 
at least that form of harm reduction in the first place. Is that still a potential for a charter challenge? Right. So that raises an excellent and very thorny legal question about whether uh, or not the charter protects positive rights. Um, yeah. So we see, for example, in the Black case that the court was very careful to say here that the applicant was not claiming, her claim was not for a standalone right to access a particular treatment, but that the way the regulations and standards had imposed limits on the way in which her treatment regime was being offered, that that violated charter rights. Similar in the Insight case, it wasn't sort of, is there a standalone right to a specific service, but is it the way in which the minister exercised their discretion um, that violates the charter? Uh, Canadian courts under Section 7 have been, uh, have repeated on a number of occasions that Section 7, there's been no case yet where Section 7 uh, protects a positive right to health. So it imposes an obligation uh, on the government to provide a certain health care service. But the courts have always left that door just slightly ajar. They've said, you know, not in this case, but we haven't said never, ever. So it raises some really interesting questions about the extent to which um, how courts might in interpret Section 7 uh, of the Charter in the future, um, where an individual is asking uh, for a service that does not, uh, that does not exist uh, at all. Absolutely fascinating. This one I'm going to uh, go back to Dale for, and uh, it comes from uh, Kershed. Uh, is there a community where Port the Portugal model has been tested in Canada or forecasted to be tested? In other words, is there a plan to maybe do a bit of a prototype or a pilot, Dale? Well, well I, yeah, I think that's what Alberta is headed towards. I mean, I don't want to speak for the government, but certainly the early indications and a lot of the evidence studied on the recovery model. And a lot of the Portugal folks have been advising, including some of the doctors that have, there's an expert advisory council here from Stanford and I can't remember all of them, but they're all have dealt with and actually helped build the Portugal model. So I think that's really what Alberta is trying to do. It's, and it's, it is a model with options and different approaches. I mean, I think people get hung up on wording for me. It's just meaning, uh, I don't, I call it a system like, uh, you know, health, they use recovery and, and that's good. But for me, I, and certainly the cost of service, we just need the right option for the right person at the right time to get the person actually the help they need, regardless of what it is. If it's if it's if it's something that needs a harm reduction, safe consumption, that exists uh, right now. If you look at uh, our downtown, I don't think our answer is that. I mean, not that that's not part of it, but holy, like it's rapidly growing. Uh, I think there's reasons for that, but uh, yeah, I think the the Alberta model here will emulate with some changes. And I've actually, since I talked to the premiers, I think I've, or sorry, we, I've spoke to two different uh, provinces uh, looking at similar stuff. So I think, you know, I think it's the perfect, everybody says, well, we need to do this now. And we got the perfect almost um case study being built between the differences in BC and Alberta with, you know, there's only one border between them. So, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to get some of these answers and and who knows the, the real answer uh, in a year or, or two might be something that's in the middle of those. But uh, you got two extremely different approaches here to look at this. One's a system and one's a part of a system. Uh, now I, I've heard two now BCs looking at some of the things that Alberta is. So maybe, right. you know, magic will happen and some of this stuff will actually end up in the right place. But, uh, I think, uh, I could safely say that Alberta is on the way to the Portugal, a uh, variation of the Portugal model. So it, it's interesting. I mean, the, the beauty of federalism is we steal ideas from each other. Uh, we look at what's working, we try and emulate. Uh, and even though that's hidden largely from the public, there are all kinds of federal, provincial, territorial groupings that where people like uh, Jean-Marc, Dale McPhee, uh, Vanessa, you know, get to kind of input. Uh, so um, we're constantly watching experiments happening in other places and seeing what we can learn, apply and apply locally. Um, one of the things that really is coming out uh, consistently is the need for partnerships and relationships 
with indigenous governments. And I had pointed a question to Jean-Marc. Carl Mack, uh, who's a RPN, asks a question with respect to this. And I was wondering, Dale, I know this is an area of passion yeah. um, for you. Uh, what, what special kind of approaches uh, have you found to be effective uh, in Edmonton and area? Well, I, I mean, you, you talked about, first of all, Indigenous, uh, you know, are different right across every province here. And, you know, there's yeah. different mechanisms and, and things. I, I think the, there's a few things, though. Um, when the recovery system that Alberta hosts this conference uh, every year, I think there was like 1500 people there, over half of them were Indigenous and a lot of leaders there. So I think there's a real acceptance, not saying everybody real acceptance of the recovery model. Everybody recognizes traumas in this, uh, like there's trauma in this, but you mean, you know, it's overrepresented in Indigenous, but it's overrepresented in a lot of other cultures, uh, when, especially when we start looking at immigration. But what I think the Indigenous folks and, you know, you, you and me, obviously, you, as you know, Dan, being Indigenous, um, the whole medicine wheel and things that are grounded in there. But the whole point is, is I, I've heard it many, many times over. You build a relationship. It's built on understanding. We want to be part of the table. We want to be part of building the program. And, you know, I think the other piece is, is there's firm belief in the Indigenous system. The answer to solve trauma isn't to give people drugs. Uh, but at the same time, they understand that there's a mechanism there that we need to keep people to the place where they actually can recover. So uh, I think the Indigenous actually, from what I've seen in Alberta and those relationships are ongoing, I think it's starting to actually form up. And I think they're very powerful leaders to help drive some of this change in this province. Is it going to be perfect? No. But I mean, if you look at it from effective failures, what we have, and continue to do more faster isn't going to work. So I think that's the whole approach on the, on the indigenous thing. And, you know, on a uh, real good sign in, in Alberta, just a few weeks ago is one of the recovery centers was announced in Enoch in, in indigenous nation. Yeah. I think that is an absolute home run build capacity, give the people in that a community. And certainly that's a fairly large indigenous community, give them the ability to be part of the solution and build their own solutions and put the culture in the component. And what you do is you stop part of the feeder system into the city, but more importantly is you use the right holistic approach on the solution. We identify the problem by race way too much and, and not use the, 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 the race as part of, or the, the culture as part of the solution. And I think that's what we're seeing shift around here. And that's real positive. We have two minutes. I want to uh, wrap up, uh, first of all, by thanking our panelists. And please join me uh, in thanking uh, the three panelists. It's so nice to get to know you, Vanessa. What a, a gift uh, you are to Ontario and to Canada. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us here. Uh, could have heard much, much more. Jean-Marc, uh, always a pleasure, always a privilege. And Dale McPhee, again, uh, the whole group, uh, you knocked it out of the park. We could have spent three hours doing this, and I'm sorry to cut it short. So uh, just in the spirit of where we left off, on May 17th, uh, we have a what we call an EDI discussion series presentation. The uh, title of it is How to Engage Effectively with First Nation Communities and Governments, and it features uh, Cadmus DeLorme and Tosh uh, Southwick. So you won't want to miss our May 17th session. Following that, we have another session referred to as a futures fund for Saskatchewan, where panel the panel includes Kelly Foley, Peter McKinnon, Pat, sorry, Matt Smith, and Ron Stiles, and they'll be discussing the recommendation in the futures report that came out in uh, 2013. Finally, for those of you who have an international relations interest, uh, join us on May 25th when the Honourable Ralph Goodale will join us to lead a discussion on contemporary UK politics and economy and what lessons Canada can learn. We have a request uh, uh, on the chat to provide the case uh, study and information backup. Uh, uh, so we'll get that from Vanessa. Uh, your slides, Jean-Marc, we'll share those. And uh, we'll be watching uh, very closely uh, how things are progressing. So uh, one last thing. Word of thanks, um, and uh, Karen has also posted links uh, to all our events in the chat for those interested. So thank you, everyone. What a wonderful team, and uh, thanks for spending a few uh, uh, an hour and a half with us uh, today. All the best. Thanks, folks. Thank you.